So, how do you stay calm during a national emergency? How do we have hope rather than despair? Uh, in our Bibles, look first at First Peter near the back of our Bibles. And uh, Peter shared a directive for us that uh, we've looked at as we're going through Acts. And I think it's very appropriate today as we come and look at the first Christian martyr, Stephen, and uh, what God did through him. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, it says, To set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet, with gentleness and reverence. This is one of the things that uh, God wants us to do. We, we are not, if we're a believer in Jesus, we are not afraid of dying. And that hope is something that comes across to other people. And when they ask us, why aren't you afraid? Why aren't you panicking? Uh, this verse gives us directions that we're to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in us. And yet we're to do it with gentleness and fear. We're not afraid of dying. So what kind of fear is good? What we're going to see in the life of Stephen is he was able to give an answer for the hope that was in him. And he did it with a fear for the souls of those who did not know Jesus Christ that he was talking to. That motivated him. That moved him to say some very harsh things to wake them up to turn them to God. And let's go to first to excuse me, Acts chapter 6. And we're going to see Stephen's character. And we're going to see Stephen's communication ability and how God used that in a great way. We'll look at Stephen this week and Lord willing, uh, next week we'll see his death and his uh, experience of looking into heaven. So next week we're going to heaven. But uh, this week we'll stay on earth and see Stephen's character and his communication that turned people to Christ. First of all, we're going to see that Stephen had an experience where some freed slaves and their descendants uh, got into an argument with him. And it helped for them to see Stephen's character and to hear his communication. Let me read uh, for us verses 8 through 10 in Acts 6. Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freed men, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilician Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Let's look at Stephen's character and then his challenges and then his competent communication. First, his character, verse 8. He was full of grace and power. Uh, grace here means that God's favor rested upon him, just as God's favor rested upon Jesus as a child, and he grew in wisdom and stature and grace, favor with God and man. Uh, Stephen, there, there's just a special quality about him where God was working through his life, as he did with Joseph, when Joseph was in Potiphar's house and in prison and in Pharaoh's court, and God blessed his work, uh, 
God's hand was in Stephen's life. And we need to pray for one another that God would just graciously work through us to reach people for him. Stephen not only was full of grace, but he was full of God's power. God gave him a special power, miraculous powers, to do wonders, it says here, great wonders and signs among the people. Uh, Stephen's wonders were not on the basketball court, uh, but they were in the temple court. And as he would go to where the people were, God just did some amazing things through. I like to know what they were. Uh, when I look up what wonders are, I mean, these, these supernatural things, like earthquakes and fire from heaven kind of stuff that God was doing spectacularly through him. He was also, it says here, performing signs among the people. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians that Jews, they look for a sign, something significant happening to show that this thing is really from God. They want, they want a sign, some miracle. And God did signs through Stephen to authenticate that the message he was giving about Jesus was really true and from God. In the book of Acts, we've seen signs like people speaking in languages that they've never studied before. I'd like to have that ability. That was a sign that woke the Jews up. What's going on here? Another sign was this man who had been lame from birth for 40 years. He was lame that Peter and John said in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And all of a sudden, this man who never walked was leaping and jumping and Praising God. That was a sign that God was at work and that people needed to listen to what these apostles had to say. So God was working in Stephen's life. And God is working in each of our lives today so that people will pay attention to what we have to say. And you go, well, he's not doing any miracles through me. Maybe he is. If God is giving you peace in the midst of a storm, if he's giving you hope when people are worrying about death, that's his power working through us so that people will listen when we speak. So let him do that. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was glad February was over. I was not a good witness in some ways in February of God's power. I was just all upset about all these things going on and stuff like that. So I began March with just stopping and asking God to reboot me. And uh, he took me to Isaiah 6, where Isaiah saw the Lord seated on the throne. God is on the throne. He's seeing that everything is going according to his plan, for his purpose, for the return of his son, that we might rule with Jesus. Wow. And it's such a comforting thing. It was for me. Uh, a verse that I was wondering if the Lord could help me find something to share with you all in the light of our coronavirus fear. And Psalm 103 mentions throne. Psalm 103 verses 17 and 19. As we think about God like he did for Stephen, wanting to do some special things in us. So we're ready to give an answer for the hope that's in us. Psalm 103 17, but the loving kindness, the mercies of the Lord, it's from everlasting on those who fear him, reverence him, and his righteousness to children's children. Isn't that great to know? That God's mercy, his steadfast love, never ceases for us. And verse 19, 
The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Everything is working together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So we see Stephen's character. The next thing as we come to Acts 6, verse 9, we see Stephen's challenges. There were some men from the synagogue of the freed men. About 20 years before Stephen, many slaves of the Roman Empire were released from slavery. Many of them went back to Jerusalem, to the holy city. And they started a synagogue there. Well, now 20 years later, those former slaves are still there with their children. And the synagogue is growing and thriving. It's one of several hundred synagogues in the city of Jerusalem where people would go to worship God and to hear his word. And one of the things that happened in synagogues in those days is that is that they let, let any Jewish man who had some study in the Torah, the law, to speak. And so apparently Stephen got up and he spoke, gave the sermon in the synagogue. And in those days, people could interrupt you while you were preaching. If they took exception to what you had to say, if something wasn't clear, they could stop you and say, wait, wait, what about so and what about this, what... Uh, explain that. And so they did that with Stephen. He was up there. He was probably telling them that the Messiah was predicted by Isaiah to die for our sins and to come back to life. And Jesus of Nazareth died for our sins. And he came back to life. And he probably mentioned that there's been people who have seen Jesus alive. He is resurrected. And somebody said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wasn't Jesus some lunatic? Wasn't Jesus, you know, a carpenter. And, and they got into discussion and an argument arose. There was some debate on this. Paul said that Jews look for signs, but Greeks, they want wisdom. They like to dis debate. They like to, to logically figure out what something is. And so these Jews who have a Greek background... They wanted to get into a good discussion with Stephen. So there's his character. There's his um, challenge in having to answer some questions to be quick on his feet. And now we're going to see his competency. Verse 10. They were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He was able to give answers. He was able to give replies. He was able to speak. You know, Jesus said that he was going to help his followers do that very thing. Look in uh, with me, please, Luke 21. Luke, who's writing the story of Acts, recorded Jesus' words in Luke Chapter 21, verse 13, I will lead, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not, did you get, catch this, make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. You worried about what to say to someone if they ask you why you have peace and hope? Don't prepare beforehand what to say. When the time comes, Jesus says, God will give you the wisdom. He will be, help you to speak in such a way it cannot be refuted. When we have opportunities to speak and God has us then in our own way, in our own words, tell our experience of how God has given us hope, how he gives us peace, how we know we're going to heaven, and how he's changed us so we are like that. It's irrefutable because it's happened to us. One cannot deny it. If they've known us, they've seen it, 
There's been a change. And God uses that to bring other people to Jesus, just like he brought us. That's here what's happening through Stephen. God is giving him the words to say. Now, that's the first round. He is able to respond and speak clearly the good news of Jesus to these people. But they can't let go of it. They want to win. And so they stir things up, and it leads where Stephen has to come before the Supreme Court of Israel. Basically, his life is on the line, and he has to give a defense. Let me read verses 11 through 15 as we see how Stephen will rebuke the Sanhedrin in a moment. 11 through 15. But let's stand together. Will you please stand with me? And I'll read these verses of how Stephen uh, is forced to be on trial for his life. This is what the freedmen do. Verse 11, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Wow. You may be seated. See, that gives us a whole new start here. Let's look at this for a moment. We're going to look again and see the challenges he had, his character, and then his communication ability in chapter 7. First of all, the challenges are great. They actually bribed people behind the scenes to say some negative things about Stephen because they just didn't like Stephen. And this is the first time that actually the populace uh, turns against the Christians. The leaders had before because of their jealousy. But now the people in Jerusalem have been turned against them because they're accused, he's accused of blasphemy in verse 11. And the sentence for blasphemy is to be killed. He's blaspheming against Moses and against God. They stirred up the people, and they also stirred up the elders, that's the Sadducees, and the scribes, the Pharisees. And they came up to him, and they dragged him away to the Supreme Court of Israel, the 70 men that were his judge and his jury. And he probably remembered what happened to Jesus not too long before this, that he had been brought to this same council, the Sanhedrin. And when Jesus was brought there, there were false witnesses who came and said that Jesus was going, said he would destroy the temple and all these things. And here, the same thing happens with Stephen. These people who never witnessed Stephen saying any of this said that he was saying it. And what are they accusing of? of speaking against the holy place and the law, for we've heard him say that Jesus will destroy this place. Oh, the temple was special to these Jewish people, particularly to the 70 Sanhedrin who were meeting in the temple grounds. In fact, there was one place on the temple grounds between the court of the Gentiles and the court of of the women where there was a sign posted. No foreigner can cross this line. If they do, they die. 
In fact, the Roman government made an exception in this case. They actually let the Jews execute people who would be Gentiles, uncircumcised, and would dare to put a toe into the sacred part of the temple area where only Jews and proselytes could worship. And people had died crossing that line. The temple was, it was holy ground. It was special to these people who had, from the Roman Empire, in their retirement had come to live in the holy city next to the holy temple. And Stephen was accused of speaking against God's temple. The other thing that they said Stephen was doing was speaking against Moses and Moses' law that he had given. Uh, the law was very, very special. The people were definitely legalists. And so those were the two things. And they said that, that he was trying to change the customs and in advocating what Jesus did in changing customs, it does remind me of the time that Jesus went north out of country to Samaria. And of all things, he made conversation with a Samaritan, not a Jew, a Samaritan woman, and he asked to share water with her. And her response was, what are you doing? Because Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. It wasn't in the custom for Jews and Gentiles, Samaritans, to socialize together. And Jesus, while he was there, and she asked, where are we supposed to worship? Where is our temple supposed to be? He said, Time's coming where it won't matter. So there, when there's smoke, there's fire. And Jesus did say some things about changing customs, about no more temple. Why was it that they had these customs that Jesus and Stephen might be seeking to change that the people were so hot about? Well, in Leviticus, chapter 5, verse 2, is one of these laws. It says, if any person touches an unclean thing, whether a carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of an unclean cattle or the carcass of an unclean swarming thing, though it is hidden from him and he is unclean, then he shall be guilty. And he'll have to make a sin offering in order to be forgiven, in order to be able to go and worship in the temple. And the Jews knew this law, that if you touch something unclean, you become unclean, and you have to have a sin offering in order to go to work in the temple. And so the custom of the Jews was such that they would not hang out and socialize and eat with a Gentile, because the Gentile didn't have those rules. And the Gentile could have touched an unclean pig that day and making their ham sandwiches. And that unclean pig may have touched a plate. And that plate may not have been cleaned and given to, with kosher food on it for a Jew. And the Jew, in fear that something unclean had touched that, they would not then even eat with a Gentile because they didn't want to touch anything that had become unclean. And so their customs made them basically prejudiced against non-Jewish people. They were afraid of this uncleanliness spreading. And so they isolated themselves. And we all know the importance of cleanliness and isolation and a fear of getting a disease. The Jews lived with that. Not just for a season, but their whole life. They were afraid that they might be unclean before God if they touched an unclean plate. 
And Stephen comes and says, Jesus wants us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And to the uttermost parts of the earth. He wants us to reach out to unclean people like he did in Samaria with the message of the gospel. And people are going, ah, oh, that's terrible. So they bring him to the Sanhedrin, to this council. And notice his response to begin with in verse 15. It is amazing. Fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council, they saw his face like the face of an angel. He had all these accusations. He's blasphemy. He's against the temple. He's against the law and its customs. He's probably defiled himself. And his response is to glow. This one who's been accused of being anti-Moses. Everyone else is probably with harsh, upset, how can you do this? Oh, they're all... And he's glowing. Like an angel. That means his face was shining. This one who was accused of being against Moses was probably the only one in that room that looked like Moses. For when Moses came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the commandments, his face glowed. And every time that Moses would go into the tent of meeting and meet with God, he would come out and his face would glow, reflecting the glory of God. And Stephen, who's being accused of being anti-Moses, God has him glow. To make it very clear that the most like Moses in the room is Stephen. Amazing, amazing thing. Now, let's take a quick look at chapter 7. And I think we can summarize it. In chapter 7, Stephen goes through the whole law, through the whole Old Testament, from Genesis 11 all the way through Exodus. And he basically makes two points. That the fathers of this Sanhedrin, their predecessors, they are known for... rejecting their own brother, Joseph. First they wanted to kill him, and then they sold him into slavery. And there are also these ancestors of his judges. Their fathers are the ones who wouldn't even listen to Moses, who would rejected him as a deliverer. Who is this one to deliver us? And who turned to worship a golden calf? While Moses was coming down, his face glowing from the mountain. They were known for rejecting God. We'll come back to that in a moment. In verse 44, he picks up the history of Israel and he talks then about the temple, which he was accused of being against. He says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. Verse 45, he talks about this tabernacle. Verse 46, he mentions how David wanted to build a temple. In verse 47, it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, Stephen gets to his point. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. You guys are all upset because Jesus said he was going to destroy this temple. You don't need to be upset. Because this temple that we're in today cannot contain God. 
Stephen knew that in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, just before he came in and burned down the temple, Ezekiel saw the glory, the presence of God leave the temple. And this rebuilt temple that Stephen and the Sanhedrin were now in, God did not dwell there. He was not limited to there. In the Holy of Holies, there was no Shekinah glory because Ezekiel says that Shekinah glory is not even coming back until the Messiah reigns on this earth. So Stephen is basically saying, what are you guys all upset about? You cannot localize God to a temple. In fact, Isaiah said, and here's Isaiah 61, 1 and verse 49 here, 749, heaven is my throne. The earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? This is such a good verse passage point for us today. God is not housebound to four walls. There are buildings today that are empty of worshipers. But you know, Jesus told the woman at the well, someday you won't worship on this mountain or that mountain, for God is spirit. You can't contain him in one place. And those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. So if we can't worship in a place of four walls, we can worship God anywhere because he is everywhere. And I encourage us If a time comes we can't worship in this building, grab some other people, get together with them, and worship God who is fully in every place. So Stephen is saying, don't be all upset about a temple being gone. God is everywhere. Then the other thing to respond to his charge that he's disobeying Moses He says in verses 51 to 53, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit and doing just as your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who previously announced the coming of the righteous one. There's two prophets who predicted that a righteous one was coming. Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah said that the righteous one would bear our sins. The people of Israel stoned Jeremiah. The people of Israel, particularly the king Manasseh, had Isaiah's song in half. That's the Jewish historical record of what happened to those. Wow, Stephen says to his court, you guys are the ones who are guilty here. Because just like your predecessors who killed Isaiah and Jeremiah, you have betrayed the righteous one and whose murderers you have now become. He turned the tables on his court. And he says the most guilty group in this room is the group that sent the Messiah to Pilate and called out, crucify him, crucify him. And I got to thinking, why would Stephen whose life is on the line here, so strongly point these people to their sin of crucifying their Messiah. Couldn't he have been quiet? Couldn't he have just said, I'm sorry? 
But I think the last verse of this chapter that we'll look at more next week gives me a clue of why he would speak so strongly. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he died. His last words were to God on behalf of this council and those who were stoning him to death. Forgive him, Lord. Stephen was able to give an answer with gentleness and a fear for those who he is speaking to. He feared for their souls. He knew where he was going. And we're going to look next week and see oh, what happened when he was going. But he knew that many of those Sanhedrin who had murdered Jesus were headed to a lake of fire. And he cared enough to be straightforward with them that the Spirit might convict them of sin. I'll give you a little preview for the rest of the book. One of the people that was there that day was Saul of Tarsus. He cared for the souls of those who were going to put him to death. And today, as we seek to apply God's word in our own situation, we, I believe, need to share God's heart for people who have diseases. Particularly those who don't know Jesus Christ. We need to care for the souls of those in China, in Italy, in the United States who don't know Christ. We need to fear for them. And let's pray for them right now. Father God, we pray for people whose life seems to be short now, who have this terrible disease, those who don't know you, that they would hear the truth that Jesus paid for their sin and rose again. And Lord, may they believe that like Saul of Tarsus would and come to know you and be assured they're going to heaven. We just commit those people to you and those who might still contract this disease. May they come to know Jesus. And Lord, in a very practical, real way, may our lives, to those we come in contact with this next week, may, may even unconsciously, may your peace and your hope and your power radiate from us that people will want to know why. And then God, if they ask, then give us the words to share our story. Because Lord, we want to see people come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.